So the U.S. sets the averages. And while the U.S. does set the average, China drives the margin. It's not only the world's fastest growing economy overall, China is, has also the f world's fastest growing consumer market and is increasing the pace of its resource, resource usage faster than any other country. When you take these two economies together, the two economies drive the prices for virtually every important commodity in the world, from food to energy to raw materials, and in large measure determine what kind of jobs are created, where, and at what pace. The rest of the world's economies not only feed American and Chinese consumption and growth, they either ride the wave of our success or suffer when we stall. Therefore, it's clear to us and clear to me that our countries have two very important responsibilities. First, to manage our own bilateral relationship well. And second, to jointly manage how the two of us together affect and interact with the wider world. I will touch on the second, but I'm going to spend a bulk of my remarks on the first. To borrow a Chinese metaphor, over the last few decades, especially before the financial crisis, the U.S. and Chinese economies have been locked in a yin-yang relationship. They are like complementary opposites that together form a whole. And neither, I would argue, is a well-balanced economy in its own, but together they set the pace for the world. For most of the duration of this relationship so far, the U.S. pursued a growth model that was based on consumption fueled by debt. China grew by increasing its investment very rapidly and by vastly expanding its export sector and by investing the resulting surplus cash mainly in the U.S. Well, we now know that that model had some real limitations. It produced illusory growth in the U.S. for a time. The U.S. has been left with a mountain of debt that could take decades to pay off. Millions of jobs have evaporated, many in industries such as construction and mortgage brokerage, and that are not really going to return to their former strength. And as America's export and manufactured, manufacturing sectors atrophied, the U.S. economy lost much of its crucial diversification. The financial crisis clearly exposed the weaknesses of the American economy and it allowed Americans to see that we face some serious structural issues, including the massive public and private debt, unsustainably low savings rate, huge trade imbalances, and lackluster exports. Now, there are some who believe the Chinese model is a lot better, and yes, China weathered the crisis more quickly with less pain, and it avoided most of the worst problems that we face here. And it did so while racking up incredible accomplishments. China's GDP has grown roughly at 10% per year for decades, rising 20-fold in the last 30 years. China recently overtook Japan as the world's second largest economy and and more importantly, depending on how you measure it, it is now either the world's number one manufacturer or just behind the U.S. No other country in the world's economic history has risen so far and so fast. The only considerable parallel is Japan in the second half of the 20th century, at least until the Nikkei and the Tokyo property bubbles deflated in the early 1990s. But it is true that the high savings, high manufacturing, export-driven model clearly holds some attraction. But the Chinese model faces its own challenges and ones that the Chinese government is aware of and is working to address. The first is the high savings rate. It's completely understandable, by the way, why the Chinese people are such diligent savers. Many feel economically insecure, the social safety net in China is less developed than that in the U.S. Capital markets are still in the early stages of development, making it necessary to save large down payments towards purchase of property or consumer durables. But all that money has to be invested somewhere. And given Chinese constraints on cross-border capital flows, this high level of private savings can't flow out of the country 
and find productive investments opportunities abroad today because only the government limps to the international markets. As a result, we can't be truly confident that what investment that does play, take place is happening efficiently. And more importantly, as too much money chases too few opportunities in the domestic market, asset price inflation is inevitable. The second is the Chinese consumer market. And the Chinese consumer market hasn't yet close, come close to fulfilling its vast potential. A savings rate of 53% translates to rates of consumer spending that are well behind China's peers in the developing world and even lower than countries that have markedly lower per capita income, that's such as India, as an example. In addition, household disposable income makes, us a makes up a surprisingly low share of Chinese GDP. Wage income is only about 45% of GDP compared to 65, 75% in the advanced industrial economies. China consumes only 35% of its annual GDP, a rate that's far, far lower than other BRIC countries and half the level of the US. I think the Chinese government and everybody understands that this low level of consumer spending could limit China's future growth, especially as consumption slows down the Western economies. And Vice Premier Wang, who I met a couple of days ago, said exactly the same thing to Charlie Rose. Uh, China faces an imbalance between savings and consumption, and it's an imbalance that is almost the mirror image of the imbalance that troubles the U.S. economy. As a matter of fact, if China's savings rate is too high, America's is too low. China's consumer spending is too low, America's is too high. America is burdened with excessive public and private leverage, and China accumulates more capital that it can productively invest at home. China lacks a sufficiently robust safety net, whereas America's safety net is fueling our debt problems and need reform. America runs a massive trade deficit, while China maintains a surplus. We all know that these imbalances aren't good for the American side of the equation, but they're unlikely to be good for the Chinese side as well. And the Chinese government officials seem to understand that very well. When China recently announced its five-year plan, it specifically talked about the need to rebalance its economy with a greater emphasis on domestic demand as a new source of growth. Chinese markets are increasingly opening up with an emphasis on industries that are high-tech, high-value-added, and low-energy consumption. But there are some very difficult decisions that the officials still face, and there are no easy answers, there are only trade-offs. For example, making the currency convertible would go a long way towards solving the liquidity problem and addressing inflation, but it might also exacerbate unemployment and slow growth. So the dialogue continues, but there's reason to be confident that China will find the right balance. On the other side, the U.S. side. We have no choice but to get our country's finance and finances in order. Second, we should work on correcting our trade imbalances, which means addressing the consumer-producer imbalance in our domestic economy. Third, we need more economic diversification. Fourth, we need to advocate for and help create a better and more productive protective environment for intellectual property around the world, and we need China's help to accomplish that. I'm not going to say much about the first point. Governor Christie was extremely articulate about the need to bring down the debt and, and approach our country's finances with real discipline. I will only say that one never sees growth without confidence. And a credible plan to address the debt is necessary to restore confidence, which in turn will inspire real investment. But when I look at the other three things that we need to do in America, they all boil down to one big need, which is America needs to become a bigger exporter 